So I want to talk to you today about a, 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 an anti-pattern, a dark pattern in product design, one that seems to have gone from a niche to right down the middle, and that's getting in the way of a lot of important things. And by way of example, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, a company that makes printers, most successful printer company on earth. Uh, last March 2016, HP pushed a security update out to its OfficeJet and OfficeJet Pro owners. Um, I call it a security update. As far as we can tell, it didn't update the security of the printer at all. It did what every security update you've ever run did, which is that it ran and then announced that it was done. And as far as you knew, you, something had been fixed. What was actually changed in those HP printers is they started counting down invisibly for six months. And in September, six months later, uh, all of those printers changed their behavior so that when they encountered third party or remanufactured cartridges, they would refuse to use them. So uh, this uh, uh, um, update uh, was run by some unknown portion of HP customers. HP claims something like two thirds compliance. I spoke to some internal whistleblowers who said it's more like 95% compliance. And when this happened, these 95 or two-thirds of, of HP OfficeJet and OfficeJet Pro owners, they didn't know what was going on. All they knew is that their formerly good printers with their formerly good cartridges had suddenly stopped working. And so, you know, they started throwing away the cartridges or swapping in known good ones. And maybe they had, you know, gone to Costco at the start of the school year and bought a whole stack of remanufactured or third-party ones. So they cycled through three or four sets and realized none of them are working, so throw away the printer. Uh, but after thousands of complaints to third-party ink sellers on message boards, people started to get an inkling of what had happened. Um, what had happened was that the company had reached into the homes of millions of its customers and deliberately broken their property as a kind of punishment for failing to arrange their private affairs in the way that was maximally beneficial to HP shareholders rather than to themselves as owners of HP printers. Now this may sound like just, you know, your garden variety ripoff, but it has much deeper implications thanks to this late 20th century copyright law that has found an extraordinarily hospitable environment here in the middle of this decade. And I'm talking about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA of 1998. You've probably heard about the DMCA. Usually it, it, it appears to be the author of all your favorite YouTube videos, as in this video has been removed thanks to a claim under the DMCA. But actually, I'm talking about a totally different section of the DMCA today. It's this big, gnarly hairball of a law. And the part that I'm talking about now is section 1201 of the DMCA. That's the part that relates to DRM, or digital rights management. We call it the anti-circumvention rule, because it makes it a crime to tamper with, or bypass, or remove DRM. Uh, and under DMCA 1201, undertaking those activities, even for legitimate purposes, even for things that would be legal, even for things that just let you enjoy your own property in legal ways, Tampering with that DRM carries heavy penalties, a $500,000 fine for a first offense, along with five years in prison. So when um, DMC 1201 passed, it was mostly thought of as a way to protect, say, the Sega Dreamcast business model in 1998, or the DVD business model. Um, it was a way to allow companies that had some idea about how they'd like their customers to conduct their lives to force those customers to do it that way and to also control their competitors so that they didn't offer something better to those customers. So for example, um, after DMC 1201 passed, DVD vendors could add a region code to the DVD and then have a region code checker in the DVD player. And if you stuck a DVD from one country into a player from another country, the DVD player would refuse to play it it's not that it couldn't play it, it's just that it, it, it wouldn't play it, right? I, I can't let you do that, Dave, you know? Um, now, it's important to note that although anti-circumvention law is usually pitched as an anti-piracy law, that this is the literal, non-figurative, non-hyperbolic opposite of piracy. When you go to a store and you buy a copyrighted work from the company that made it at the price that they're asking for and then try to watch it, that's not what we call piracy, right? That is what we hope people will do instead of piracy. Now, you may be watching it in the way that isn't most profitable to the firm, but that is assuredly not piracy. 
Now, for Segas and the early consoles, this also allowed companies to enforce their, uh, their, their wishes as though they were their rights. So Sega wanted, had a kind of early version of the App Store business model. They wanted to make sure that any little company that was making software to run on your computer, on your Sega, that they would have to go through Sega first to get to your Dreamcast, that they would have to press their CDs at Sega's CD pressing factories, which charged a really high markup on it, so that they could get a little percentage of everything sold for, for the computer that you bought, your computer. And once again, like choosing to buy a game from the person who made it at the price that they want to pay to charge you, um, and then running it on a computer that you bought fair and square, that is not piracy. That is the literal non-hyperbolic opposite of piracy. But if you have to break the DRM to get a third-party game to run on your console, anti-piracy law gets in the way. So every business, they have a mix of commercial preferences and legal rights. Uh, Sega had the legal right to prevent you from like cloning their chips and making cheap Sega Dreamcast knockoffs. Um, and they had a commercial preference to be the gatekeeper for all the games sold that would run on the computers we bought from Sega. And by designing those computers so that you had to break DRM in order to play the game that they didn't want you to play, they could make that commercial preference into an enforceable legal right that our public courts would pay to enforce, that they wouldn't even have to pay to enforce. And this is kind of a license to print money. I mean, what CEO has ever not wanted it to be a literal felony to thwart their business plans? So who wouldn't take them up on that offer. So companies began to poke at the DMCA, not just entertainment companies, but all kinds of companies. In 2002, 2003, a couple of hardware companies took a run at it. And one of them was um, Lexmark. Uh, Lexmark was then the, uh, the printer division of IBM. And uh, Lexmark made these toner cartridges uh, that were full of black powder that they charged more for than you'd pay for caviar. And uh, one of their competitors, a company called Static Controls, which ironically now owns Lexmark, um, this company, they started uh, making their own black powder and putting them in empty Lexmark cartridges and selling them back to the people who had used up the cartridge in the first place to put back in their printer. Now, the Lexmark uh, cartridges, they had a little tiny primitive computer. Primitive because this was like 2002 when computers were big and expensive and couldn't do much, not like today. And this primitive computer, it ran a little tiny program, 12 bytes long. And this program had one thing to do. When you used up all the black powder in your cartridge, the program flipped a bit that now said, I'm an empty cartridge. And if you refilled the cartridge with new black powder, and then put it back in your printer, the printer would say, hey, cartridge, are you an empty cartridge? And the cartridge would say, I'm an empty cartridge. And then the printer wouldn't work anymore. Now, um, uh, Lexmark argued that uh, the DMCA made it a felony to reverse engineer this 12-byte program and um, make it say, I'm, an empty, I'm a full cartridge. Uh, and the court said, well, where's the copyrighted work that you are invoking this law over. Because the DMCA protects access to copyrighted works. And Luxmark said, well, it's right there. It's that 12-byte program. That 12-byte program is our copyrighted works. Software is copyrighted. You can't tamper with our controls on our copyrighted works. Uh, DMCA protects us. And the court said, you're right. Software can be protected. But 12 bytes is not long enough to rise to the standard of copyrightability. This is not even a haiku. It doesn't get a copyright. So. <laughs> You don't have a case here. Now, that brings us back to, uh, to HP. Um, back in 2003, even a company making as much bank off of its black powder as Lexmark could not afford to put a full-fledged computer inside its disposable toner cartridges. But that is not the case anymore. HP has tens of thousands of lines of code in those toner cartridges, in those uh, ink cartridges. And those ink cartridges are assuredly containers for not just ink, but copyrighted works. If you can't copyright the entire operating system, networking stack, and all the cruft that comes with the system on a chip that's in that HP cartridge, then pretty much no software is eligible for copyright protection. And so this is no longer the case that you can invoke uh, the DMCA 
uh, only over entertainment products because now every product that is smart has copyrighted works inside of it. Now, um, when HP decides that you must treat their commercial preference to spend more on ink than you would on vintage Veuve Clicquot as a legally enforceable right, the DMCA probably goes along with them. It's probably the case that the DMCA is enforceable here because Section 1201 of the DMCA makes it a crime to bypass access controls for copyrighted works. And they definitely have copyrighted works inside of there. Now, it's, it's not hard to figure out how to get around this if you choose to, if you, if you are so uh, risk accepting that, you, that you're willing to risk the wrath of HP. Um, to defeat uh, this uh, uh, measure, all you need to do is reverse engineer the chip on HP's cartridge and figure out where they've stashed the little secret protocol that HP and its printers go through to figure out whether the cartridge is original or not. And that may sound daunting to you and me, but all you need to do if you have an idea about how to break this is go buy an HP cartridge. So if someone somewhere in the world has a theory about what mistakes HP might have made in designing this protocol, in order to test their theory out, all they need to do is walk down to Best Buy or log into Mr. Bezos' Magic Everything Emporium and have, have a few of these shipped to them to try and, and, and get uh, underneath. Um, so this is true of every DRM system that, that has ever been made. Um, uh, DRM systems are premised on the idea that you can hide a secret in a piece of equipment that you give to your adversary. And there's a name for this in security research circles. We call this wishful thinking, right? You, even if you had the world's greatest bank safe, you would keep it in the bank vault. You wouldn't give it to the bank robber to keep in his living room. Because given enough time and resources, uh, a skilled adversary will eventually figure out one mistake that you made. You have to be perfect and make no mistakes. They have to find one mistake you made in order to figure out how to remove this DRM. So it's not hard to break HP's DRM, but it is legally terrifying. Uh, and the investors and retailers and the other necessary parties to the value chain that would bring a third party DRM breaking HP printer or firmware load to market, they have to risk the possibility that this Fortune 100 company with this huge war chest will not come after them with the full force of the law when they challenge their core business model. That's a hard bet to make. So this brings me to the Internet of Things. Uh, printer cartridges are not the only software-equipped devices in our world today. As Mark Andreessen famously reminded us, software is eating the world. And software is copyrightable. So once you put software in a gadget, you can use DRM to give you the right to force people to use the gadget in the way that's best for you, the manufacturer, and not the gadget's owners. And there is no intrinsic Internet of Things business model. If you're making hardware, you're generally in trouble because the margin on hardware starts around 2% and falls off sharply from there. Ironically, if you have successful hardware, that's when your margins disappear altogether because that's when you get cloned in the Pacific Rim and people stop buying your hardware entirely. And so everyone who's raising money for Internet of Things is doing so by going to investors and saying, we are going to monopolize the ecosystem for our hardware. We'll be the only ones who can fix it. We'll be the only ones who can make parts for it. We'll be the only ones who can make consumables for it. We'll be the only ones who can sell apps for it. And so we'll monetize all of that. And besides, maybe our exit will be that someone will buy us for the data we have on our customers. And since our Internet of Things gadget is going to be in a position to gather all kinds of data on our customers, we'll just indiscriminately gather all the data we can find on those customers and store it in case that turns into an acquisition strategy. Now, obviously, making sure that people buy parts or services or apps from you, that's not a legal right. It's a commercial preference. But if you design a device so that third-party ink or parts or service requires bypassing DRM, then you can make that preference into an enforceable legal right. And that's why DRM is now metastasized. Uh, last summer, the U.S. Copyright Office held hearings on this, sorry, summer before last, summer 2015. The U.S. Copyright Office held hearings on this, and they heard from people who said, we're finding DRM in cars, 
and tractors and thermostats and baby monitors and voting machines and implanted defibrillators and pacemakers and insulin pumps. And then that year at CES, we got this. This is the Internet of Things rectal thermometer. We now have DRM up our literal asses. <laughs> So what does this have to do with security? Because we've heard about how this impacts all these other realms, but what about security? Well, DRM works by hiding its keys in user accessible equipment, which requires that the device be designed to be as opaque to its users as possible. After all, if there's an icon on your desktop labeled HAL9000.exe, you will assuredly drag it into the trash. And so everyone who's ever made DRM for a system also figured out a way to hide some of what that system was doing from the user and from systems that the user might employ to keep the, that computer safe, uh, antivirus software and so on. If there's a way that a user process can find the DRM process and kill it, that user process will find that DRM process and kill it. No one woke up this morning and said, gosh, I wish there was a way that I could do less with my computer. Maybe there's a product somewhere that can do that for me. So in, in crypto, we had this idea that there's Alice and Bob and Carol. Uh, Alice and Bob want to send each other a message, and evil Carol, my apologies to anyone in the room called Carol, evil Carol wants to eavesdrop on Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob, they start with this assumption that Carol knows a bunch of things about what's going on. So they assume Carol knows uh, that Alice and Bob have sent a message because they assume that um, Carol is on the same network as them because that network could be the internet or everyone connected to your cable operator or everyone at a tech conference on the same Wi-Fi link or everyone on this, under the same footprint of a uh, continent-spanning satellite. So Carol knows that the message has been sent and Carol can also get a copy of the message. And so they assume that Carol knows what, what's in the message, but they still have to keep Carol from being able to read the message. And so the way that they keep Carol from reading the message is they use an encryption algorithm, some math that scrambles it. But they also assume that Carol knows which math they use to scramble the message. Um, because the only way to, to validate whether a security system works is to tell as many people as possible how you think it works so they can tell you if you've made any dumb mistakes. Right? Anyone can design a security system that works on people who are stupider than them. But unless you're the smartest person in the world, eventually some smarter Carol than you is going to figure it out. I mean, that's why science is based on publication, because everyone is capable of kidding themselves that they haven't made any mistakes. This is why we have uh, commits and double checks when we, send, uh, when we make websites live, because we all make dumb mistakes all the time, and many eyeballs are what makes bugs shallow. So Alice and Bob and Carol all know that the message has gone out, they all have a copy of the message, and they all know how the message was scrambled. But Carol lacks one piece of information that Alice and Bob has. Carol doesn't have the key. And because crypto works, because we have subjected the math to adversarial peer review, we are very certain that without the key, Carol will never be able to descramble the message. I mean, how certain are we? Like, if Carol could turn all the hydrogen atoms in the universe into computers, and if those hydrogen atoms did nothing until the heat death of the universe but guess at the key, we would run out of universe before we ran out of possible keys. So that's like normal crypto, and it's, it works, right? It's why, like, all of you aren't being robbed blind at this moment by uh, identity thieves who are breaking into your bank account by harvesting your credentials from the Wi-Fi network. Um, but in the DRM business model, we don't have Alice and Bob and Carol, we just have Alice and Bob. Like think about Netflix, right? Netflix wants to send you a video and they wanna make sure that whatever program you're using to descramble the video doesn't have a save button. That's their security threat, right? Someone saves a video. And so uh, they provide you with a player uh, and they send an encrypted video to the player, and then inside the player is the key to decrypt the video, and uh, that program is designed to throw away the decrypted video as soon as you're done watching it, and that player doesn't have a save button. So Netflix figures they're in the clear. Except they just gave you the player with the key in it, and maybe you're not smart enough to figure out where they hid the key, but somewhere out there is like, a bored grad student with nothing to do this weekend, her own electron tunneling microscope, and a room full of undergrads hanging around like a bad smell, who is gonna figure out where in that user accessible equipment they hid the key. 
When it's just Alice and Bob, and Bob sends Alice the key and then crosses his fingers and hopes that Alice isn't ever going to figure out where he hid it, Bob is not acting like a, a smart security practitioner. Now, another important note about Netflix here is that although Netflix has a strong commercial preference that they would like to be a legal right, Netflix only exists because commercial preferences aren't legal rights. Many of you will remember that Netflix got their start by mailing physical DVDs to people. They still do for, for some people who don't have, want to stream their videos. What you may not remember is that the MPAA was really angry about this. America's movie studios blustered and threatened and shook their, sa their sabers at Netflix and said, we have a strong commercial preference that you not mail DVDs around. But Netflix said, your commercial preference is not a legal right, get bent. <laughs> now, every pirate wants to be an admiral, and now that Netflix has achieved its legitimacy, it is willing to assert that its uh, commercial preferences are legal rights, uh, and that is as, as it may be. That's what every uh, pirate has ever done when they achieve the admiralty. Uh, the only difference is this time we're listening to them. So well-designed DRM, even the best designed DRM, ends up being fertile soil for malicious software. Because in order to make DRM work, because Alice can always look at the DRM and figure out where the keys are, we have to ban investigating DRM and disclosing what you find there. And so uh, the courts and the advocates of the DMCA have said that any security practitioner who wants to blow the whistle on mistakes made in implementing DRM commits the same crime as someone who, who uh, breaks the DRM to commit an act of piracy or to do any other thing that thwarts their commercial wishes. And so they have asserted that anyone who comes forward to warn you that a system that you are relying on is not fit for purpose is committing a crime. And this has real world consequences because nobody wants to find out the hard way whether or not they're going to be the next uh, security practitioner to go to jail. There was one security practitioner in America who's already gone to jail for doing this, a guy named Dmitry Skilyarov, who was hauled off the stage at a security conference and thrown in jail by the FBI and then deported back to Russia for revealing defects in an Adobe product. Um, uh, an Adobe product that, by the way, lots of people have on their computers and which could, in theory, be a vector for installing all kinds of malware on their machines. Um, and so even well-designed DRM ends up being hospitable territory for DRM. Uh, when Sony fielded uh, 51 million audio CDs with a piece of uh, DRM in it called a rootkit, uh, it opened the door for 300,000 US government and military networks to be infected with malicious software that used the rootkit to hide themselves from the antivirus software on those computers. Because Sony had modified those computers so it couldn't see their DRM, by pretending to be DRM, other malicious software could sneak in and infect those computers. So um, giving companies a veto over who gets to disclose the mistakes that they've made that put their customers in harm's way is not a good idea for reasons that I hope are obvious. But in case you haven't figured it out, just because the security researchers don't come forward with the defect. It doesn't mean the defect won't be exploited. Anything that one security researcher can find, another security researcher can find. And that second security researcher may not want to disclose the bug. They might want to weaponize that bug and sell it to criminals, to identity thieves, to repressive governments who want to spy on their citizens, or even to our own police. And this is why the Internet of Things is a dumpster fire. So last September, a security researcher named Brian Krebs uh, identified uh, the two young men behind a, uh, uh, a denial of service company in Israel. Uh, these guys hired themselves out to knock rival gamers or online casinos offline by flooding them with traffic. Uh, they were turning over in the tens of thousands of dollars a year. There were a couple of low-level petty crooks. And Brian Krebs outed them. And after he outed them, his website was knocked offline by a sustained 620 gigabit per second denial of service flood. 
This is the kind of flood that we normally associate with one powerful government attacking another. But it wasn't one powerful government attacking another. It was a couple of dum-dums and their friends getting revenge on a security journalist halfway around the world. It turned out that the reason they were able to direct these huge punishing floods is because they had uh, taken advantage of an Internet of Things worm called Mirai that was infecting smart light bulbs and PVRs and CCTVs and using them to direct this enormous amount of traffic at him. Now, um, that uh, worm was called Mirai, and uh, its source code leaked online about a week later. And when security researchers audited it, the words they used to describe it were clumsy and amateurish. And one week later, that clumsy, amateurish worm, which was nevertheless overmatched for the even worse Internet of Things, had infected systems in every country on the planet that had reliable electricity and Internet access. And then a week after that, uh, it was used to direct these floods of traffic that knocked down services like Dyne and PayPal and Twitter, uh, some of the best defended systems in the world. So this problem is not going away anytime soon. These are forever day bugs because the people who are being attacked by them, they don't even know they have them. Uh, they don't know they have them because these systems are being used to attack third parties instead of uh, themselves. And so they don't even notice that their computers are infected, their CCTVs, their PVRs, their smart light bulbs. But attacks that uh, harness devices to attack third parties are only the start of the story. There's real risks that become much sharper when devices are turned against their owners themselves. So uh, in 2013, for example, a young woman named Cassidy Wolf, who just that year been crowned Miss Teen USA, was on the web when she landed on a website that had been infected by uh, a creep and that creep was looking for browsers that were vulnerable to a, a, a bug that he knew about that he'd weaponized. And when she landed on that website, her computer was compromised by something called a remote access trojan, or RAT. And this RAT was able to remotely operate her camera and microphone, harvest all of her keystrokes, and also plunder her hard drive. And this rat captured incidental nude images of her standing in front of her camera while she dressed in the morning and undressed at night. He uh, captured her social media passwords and he threatened to blackmail her uh, by releasing these images to her social media accounts unless she performed live sex acts on camera for him. Now, because Cassidy Wolf was Miss Teen USA, she had an agent. The agent knew how to get in touch with the FBI. The FBI busted the creep. The creep had over 140 victims, including minor children all over the world. And after that, the FBI raided 100 more ratters. And these ratters had uh, a maximum of 400 victims. Now, charmingly, ratters call their victims slaves. So that's what happens when your laptop is turned against you. And then, uh, summer 2015, uh, some researchers discovered that GMC's Jeeps were vulnerable to networked attacks. So uh, they built, or GM rather, built these Jeeps, these Chrysler Jeeps, uh, with um, active on-demand hotspots. So your kids are restless in the back seat, you want to turn on Netflix for them, you type your credit card number into your dashboard computer, it lights up a hotspot that uses a, a Sprint SIM uh, under the dashboard to connect your car to the internet for 24 hours. Um, GM unwisely decided to save a, a few pennies by cross-connecting that system to the CAN bus, which connects and networks the steering, the brakes, the transmission, uh, all the electric systems. And their security model was based on the idea that since no one used Sprint, no one would be on the same network as them. <laughs> so all of these cars, they could be remotely driven over the internet. They had to recall 1.4 million Jeeps that summer. Uh, later, six months later, uh, in San Francisco, um, a mom's three-year-old was complaining that the phone in his room was scaring him at night. That's what he called his baby monitor. One night she was walking past the door and she heard a stranger swearing at her child out of the baby monitor. She uh, walked into the room as one of those steerable baby monitors. The camera turned around to look at her. The stranger's voice said, uh-oh, mommy's in the room. And the baby monitor went dark, and she never found out who that person was. Uh, later that year at the DEF CON security conference, uh, security researchers released their audit of the top 10 best-selling uh, baby monitors. They found all of them were easily crackable and vulnerable to this kind of hijacking. Um, so with this law, DMCA 1201, we have given companies every incentive they need to add DRM in their products. And in so doing, we're not just putting ourselves at the security risk, we're actually um, 
putting the very idea of private property itself at risk. If the dead hand of the manufacturer lays on your device after you've purchased it, ready to rise up and go upside your head should you choose to use that device in the way that's best for you and not their shareholders, then you don't own the device. You are at best a leaseholder of that device. You are a tenant farmer of that device. And we have a name for a system in which only a small number of people are allowed to own property and everyone else has to rent it from them and use it to their benefit. It's called feudalism. But at least in feudalism, the aristocracy are humans. In our new feudalism, powered by the DMCA, our aristocrats are immortal life forms that are transhuman that we have created called uh, limited liability corporations, and they treat us alternately as their food source and their inconvenient gut flora. <laughs> so this is bad news. Uh, we are one RFID system away from a dishwasher that won't accept third-party dishes. We <laughs> are one vision system away from a toaster that won't accept third-party bread. And for the same reason that reconfiguring your iPhone to use third-party apps is a felony, reconfiguring any of these devices to use third-party consumables or parts is also a felony. So it's, get, it's getting worse. Uh, in 2013, the World Wide Web Consortium, who make open standards for the web, decided that they had no choice but to start standardizing DRM to go in every web browser because Netflix had effectively threatened to boycott the web if they didn't get it. And since then, they have plowed ahead with doing this. We tried to get them not to do it at EFF. We joined the W3C and we made all these arguments. And they said, you know, these are all problems with this law, the DMCA, and its global equivalents. Because the US Trade Representative has promulgated versions of this law in every country in the world. They said, you've got a problem with a law, not with the technology. Come back to us when you have a solution for the law. So we came back to them. We said, all right, your members say that all they want is the right to enforce copyright. So let's take all these other rights off the table. Let's make a membership in the W3C contingent on promising to only invoke the DMCA where there's some other offense, copyright or secondary copyright infringement, theft of trade secret, tortious interference, some other offense. So that it's not just you have displeased me in your use of my product which I sold to you, but rather something that someone has done that violates a specific right enumerated by some legislature somewhere in the world. And the W3C members who advocate for DRM, which are the largest companies of the world, including companies that many of you work for because they're headquartered here in Seattle, I won't name them, those, um, those companies said, no, we're not interested in that approach. Uh, we really do want the right to decide who and when our devices can be used, our technologies can be used in ways that are otherwise lawful but which thwart our commercial desires. In fact, they went even further. Two weeks ago, they released a set of um, guidelines, voluntary guidelines for their members to decide when they should use this new right to sue security researchers who utter true facts about the state of devices and systems that we all rely on. And when we talk about browsers, we're talking about something with billions of users and something that is intended to be the control surface for the Internet of Things. So, whoops, what just happened there? Did I just... I did say the wrong thing. Oh, no! Come on. No? Yeah, I think so. I think that is DRM. Uh, everything looks good on my side. Is it uh, the AV side? Anyway, um, so let's get back to printers while, while we work on the AV stuff. That might be it for, for the slides. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give a, uh, an assistive track here. Imagine that HP slide is back on the screen here. So in, in 2011, a security researcher from Columbia University named Ong Kui decided that he would investigate how secure our printers are. Uh, he decided he'd look at HP printers because HP printers are the most widely used printers in the world, right? You rob banks because that's where the money is. And he discovered that the way you update the operating system of an HP printer is by sending it a print job that has an invisible code in it that says, everything from here on in is a new operating system, please install it, with no validation. <laughs> so he started to make like word files called things like resume.doc that had their own um, uh, operating systems. And after this operating system was dumped on your HP printer and it was reflashed, 
it would accept new software updates. It would increment the version number on the little LCD on the, on the printer. It just wouldn't install it. In fact, the only way to uh, trust that printer again was to melt it down and make a new one out of it. Because after he took over your printer, he started scanning every print job you sent it for credit card numbers and social security numbers, uh, which he would then exfiltrate to his own laptop by opening a reverse shell out of your corporate firewall to him. It also crawled the network and looked for unpatched machines and took them over too. It also uh, batched and sent him copies of everything you sent to your printer. So it was just a piece of proof of concept malware. So what does it mean that HP is now shipping fake security updates to their customers, security updates that you have every incentive not to install? Well, it, it means that uh, all of those customers are going to have to face a choice whenever a new update comes down. Take the chance of having all of their data being leaked by their printers, of having their printers serve as an exfiltration bridge to the rest of the internet for their whole local area network, or install it and take the chance that HP is going to take away something that was on their printer when they bought it, that they value it for, and that um, HP doesn't want them to have anymore. So um, imagine now that that map of Mirai infecting all the countries in the world is back on the screen. Uh, HP, it's a dress rehearsal for the future, for the future of the internet of vulnerable, illegal to audit things on fire. <laughs> every incentive that HP had to do this crazy, terrible thing is present for everyone who is pursuing this ecosystem strategy and controlling it with the DMCA. That is the natural endpoint of this dark pattern. So we have to do something about this. We need to adopt principles that expand on that proposal we made to the W3C that you shouldn't um, use this law to attack people doing legitimate things. We need to expand those principles. What are we trying now? I'm going to uh, take your laptop. Oh, you're going to take my laptop. <laughs> Dearie me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We need to expand those principles to other domains, to things like licenses, intercompany agreements, professional codes of conduct, so that they become binding on us in many ways, so that it becomes progressively harder, not easier, to do this. And I have two principles that I'd like you to consider adopting. The ironclad, never breakable rules, the we the people, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of an internet of things we can trust. The first one, is that devices should obey their owners. Whenever a device receives conflicting orders from its owners and from a remote party, no matter who that party is, the owner should always, 100% of the time, win. And the second one is that true facts about the security of computers are always and under every circumstance legal to disclose. After, ooh, look at you. Uh, if you want to tap forward a few slides, Oh, I've got, a, I've got a clicker, don't I? There we go. The second one is that security facts should be legal to disclose. That under every circumstance, telling the truth about a computer should be legal. These are not extreme positions, but I charge you to be an extremist for them. If they're not calling you a fanatic, if they're not calling you a Puritan, if they're not saying you're being unreasonable and unrealistic, you are not trying hard enough. If we computerize the world and fail to safeguard the users of computers from coercive control, history will not remember us as the leaders of progress, but as the blind handmaidens of tyranny. So how are we going to fix this? Um, well, we can't fix it through individual action. Uh, just like no one person is going to recycle their way out of climate change, no one person is going to make the choices that are going to solve this big correlated problem that spans so many domains. We are going to need to be collective in how we work on this to make deep structural changes. And Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a charity that I consult for, although they don't pay me, uh, I get paid through the MIT Media Lab. So it's not like your support of EFF goes into my pocket. But EFF, an organization that I've worked, on and off, I've worked for on and off for uh, 25 years, we're doing something about this. And we're good at it. We've been fighting for a free, fair, and open inf internet infrastructure for a quarter of a century. We won the lawsuit 
that forced the NSA to give up on its project to keep crypto out of civilian hands. We won the lawsuit that said that the FBI can't look at email without a warrant. And we are fighting now for this. Um, killing the RM isn't just a duty, it's an opportunity. By getting rid of the incentives to make DRM, we are creating a marketplace for a better internet of things. One where our computers are obedient. Ones where our computers are designed to be controlled by their users, not to control their users. Now getting our computers right, that is not the most pressing problem the human race has today. Fixing climate change, solving uh, economic inequality, addressing racial injustice, poverty, and gender and disability rights, those are all more important than how our computers work. But we're not gonna win any of those fights without working computers that we can trust. This is the most fundamental fight we have, not the most urgent one. Killing DRM opens up our devices to be the honest servants we need to make the genuine magic of technology happen that allows us to work that everyday miracle of working together across time and space to improve our world. That is, after all, the oldest and noblest project of our species. Network devices have the power to make all of our lives better in millions of ways, to give us abilities that we never had or abilities that time or disability have stolen from us, to give us superpowers that our ancestors could hardly dream of. And it may not feel like it, but we are nearly there. 15 years ago, nobody was even thinking about this stuff except for EFF. But now, there's a proliferation of groups. Free, free Software Foundation and Creative Commons, Public Knowledge, Demand Progress, Software Conservancy, Software Freedom Law Center, the Internet Civil Engineering Task Force. And now there are literally billions of free software users out there in the world. Everyone who's got an iPhone has a BSD computer in their pocket, and everyone who's got an Android device has a Linux device in their pocket. And all of those devices spend most of their days talking to free software containers in a free software-based cloud. But there are also, unfortunately, tens of millions of people who've learned the hard way that badly designed technology can destroy their lives. People who've had their lives ruined by breaches and hacks and who just want to be, know, who just want to be told now what to do about it. People now know there's a problem and that's progress too because for the last 20 years we've been trying to convince people that there's a problem. And now they're here banging on our doors asking us what to do about it. This is a user experience opportunity to give people hope in darkness, to convince them that there are ways that their computers can keep them safe instead of betraying them. So at EFF, we're running this project called Apollo 1201. Uh, Apollo, like the space mission, like the moon mission, and 1201, like DMCA 1201, the law that caused all this mischief. And through this project, we aim to kill all the DRM in the world within a decade. We've started with a lawsuit against the US government to invalidate Section 1201 of the DMCA, representing two people, a Johns Hopkins security researcher named Matthew Green and a legendary hardware designer named Andrew Bunny Wang. And this lawsuit will run for years to come. It's going to take a decade to get to the Supreme Court. And while we're wending our way there, risk-tolerant designers, security researchers, and entrepreneurs, they can short DRM and go long on freedom by taking action based on these legal theories, by starting to make devices that unlock the, the systems that arrive locked on our doorsteps. As legal protection for DRM is eroded in the US, all the countries that the US has pressured to adopt their own versions of this law, which is every industrial country in the world except Israel, they'll have no good reason to keep this law on their books. When Americans are jailbreaking, uh, preserving legal protection for DRM in the UK or in Hungary or in any other country won't stop people there from buying American jailbreaking tools. It'll just mean that only American companies benefit when they do. Suicide packs are supposed to be mutual. And if America backs out on its side of the deal, well then so will all these other countries too. And that's how we'll kill DRM everywhere. So I'm a science fiction writer and people ask me if I'm optimistic or pessimistic about the future. And the thing is that optimism and pessimism, they're predictions. And if there's one thing I know about being a science fiction writer, it's that as a trade, we suck at making predictions about the future. 
we are the proverbial Texas marksmen. We have made so many predictions and we only pay attention to the ones that hit and ignore the ones that miss. We've fired our shotgun into the side of the barn and then drawn the target around the place where the pellet holes are. So rather than being optimistic or pessimistic, I'm gonna ask you to do something different. I'm gonna ask you to have hope. Hope is why when your ship sinks in the middle of the sea, you tread water. Not because you have a realistic expectation of being rescued, but because everyone who has ever rescued treaded water until help arrived. Hope is the necessary but insufficient precondition for improving your situation. And there are ways you can express that hope. You can join EFF, join its mailing list, contact your lawmakers. There's never been a time when it was more urgent to do that. Um, but there's another thing. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but no matter how purely you try to live your life, you will always end up spending money on things that are going against the grain of what you want to accomplish. Every vegetarian eventually meets a vegan. Every vegan every eventually meets a fruitarian who eventually meets a breatharian. So I try to be as good as I can in my spending choices. But at the end of every month when I look at my bills, I realize that I've spent hundreds of dollars on companies whose products are designed to destroy the future that I want to live in whether that's my ISP who want to destroy network neutrality, or my laptop company who want to destroy open computing, or any of the other entities out there whose goals are antithetical to mine. And this is a source of enormous despair. So I learned something from Denise Cooper, who's one of the great theoreticians of open source. She said every month she tithes exactly as much money as she spent destroying the future with organizations that will help preserve that future. Now, I give my money to EFF, but I also spread it around those other organizations I just mentioned, as well as ACLU, who in addition to doing work on migration, are also doing amazing work on software freedom and network freedom. So that's one thing you can do, you can tithe. The next thing you can do is talk about this with people who should know better. So oftentimes when you talk about this stuff, people say, how can I can explain this to my mom? It's always people's moms which is crazy because no one ever designs stuff for moms, so moms have to be ninjas to use technology, right? It's like, it's, it, you, know, you know, you have to make stuff simple for, it's bosses. Bosses are the ones who get everything handed to them on a silver plate because they're the ones who sign the procurement orders. So they say, they should be really saying, how can I explain this to my boss? You don't need to explain this to your boss yet because when you look at um, the number of people who support EFF or even ACLU on these efforts, you'll see that it's in the tens of thousands. And then when you look at the number of people who should know better, the people who subscribe to technical subreddits, the people who uh, lurk on Hacker News, even the people who read Slashdot, it's orders of magnitude more. So I'm going to ask you to find two people who should know better, two people who are as technologically savvy as you are, but who haven't been thinking about this issue, and sit down and describe what I've just told you to them. And there's versions of this talk online you can watch with them or uh, read about and talk to them about. And then come back a week later and ask them if they thought about it and whether they're willing to talk to two people too. There is a lot on the line here. We're trying to figure out if our future is going to be one where our devices obey us, a uh, future where we are allowed to warn each other about the ways in which our devices are not fit for purpose. Uh, and none of us gets to choose which future we're going to arrive at, not individually. But together, we have a chance. And I think we need to take it, because there's too much at stake not to give the fight everything we have. Thank you. So we have about... 10 minutes for questions. I like to call alternately on people who identify as women or non-binary and people who identify as male or non-binary, so it's not just a sausage fest. And I remind you that uh, a question is not a long rambling statement followed by what do you think of that. Uh, there's a woman in the front here, if we can start there. Can we start up here? I got a really quick one. Can we start with a woman and we'll come back to you? Thanks. say I've got a really big one, sausage All right. Why on earth, given the seismic impact of some of this, don't companies think that the greater good is in their best interest? So Economically it, speaking, that is. I think that um, this is, th there are lots of instances in which collectively we act in a way that is bad for the whole group because it's better for us. In fact, we have a, like a formal name for it in economics, and, and it's a funny word because we use it colloquially all the time, it's corruption. Corruption is when your actions 
give you some benefit, but impose a, a diffused cost on everyone else that exceeds the benefit. It's pretty much the definition of corruption. When, when you get a benefit that imposes an aggregate cost that's higher than your benefit, but that cost is uh, diffused so that the people who are paying it don't have any easy way to come together and force you to cease your conduct. So the canonical example is polluting the water. You save pennies by polluting the water, and your neighbors have to spend dollars to get the pollution out again. Um, but because their dollars are diffused and your pennies add up to millions, you get to lobby for more rights to pollute and their costs are diffused and they don't ever get to come back uh, against you unless we have mechanisms like class action lawsuits. And it's not a coincidence that using most technology today requires you to surrender your right to class action lawsuits in favor of binding arbitration. Because it, and that, that, that decision, that law that allows the force binding arbitration is itself a reflection of corruption. There was so much money left over from corruption that it was available to lobby for laws that would magnify corruption. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. Sir, you had a question back there. So what's the elevator pitch? So what's the elevator pitch? The elevator pitch is we have these systems that are designed to um, force us to use our computers in ways that are better for the manufacturer than they are for us. And a dumb law from the, from the last millennium is hanging around and making it illegal to, uh, to, to get around that. And it poses a risk to all of us. But we can change it because there's money to be made in breaking DRM and allowing people to do more with their stuff. Is that good? How about to your conservative friends? Well, funny you should mention, I am going to, the, to, to DC on Monday to speak uh, at an event convened by a bunch of conservative think tanks, including the Heritage Foundation, about the way that this interacts with property rights. If there's one thing that defines conservatism, it is a belief in strong property rights. You know, in, in the 18th century, William Blackmel, Blackwell wrote the canonical definition of private property, the one that's now taught in every law class in the world. He said, private property is that which man exercises sole and despotic dominion over to the exclusion of all other people in the world, right? If you can't reconfigure it to do what you want, it's not your property. You don't have that sole and despotic dominion. And I think that's a very good conservative pitch, that you bought it, you own it, it's yours, you can use it the way you want. How's that? Good. Uh, are there any people who identify as female or non-binary who'd like to ask the next question? Take a moment to think about it, it's okay. <laughs> Whatever right. happened to HP? I mean, are they, is it under litigation? Or? We'll go over there after that. Uh, what's happened to HP? So HP got 20,000 letters of complaint. Uh, they uh, non-apologized. Like, We're sorry you're angry at us. Uh, <laughs> they put up a download on their website that if you knew it existed, you could download and use to unbreak your printer. But they did not promise not to re-break it with the next security update. They did, however, promise to communicate more clearly next time. Uh, there are some class action lawyers who are pursuing this. If, uh, if you or anyone you know was affected by this and they live in the US and they want access to these class action lawyers, they can send me an email. I'm uh, Corey at EFF.org, C-O-R-Y at EFF.org. Um, over there, thank you. Yes, um, I actually wanted to ask a question about what you talked about for profit margins. So we talked about how small it is for hardware for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. So I agree with you, everything that you're saying, but then where does that leave profit margins? You know, where does that, where is that gonna be made up is I guess what I'm trying to say. If that's, what did you say selling? selling cartridges. So where do the margins come from? That's a, so that's a, an important question, but I don't think it's a question we usually ask governments to answer. Right, so like I come up with a business idea. I'm like, well, I'd like to, um, I'd like to, s to outsell everyone else's lemonade stand by selling premium lemonade that costs uh, 49 cents a glass to make instead of one cent a glass to make. Now the set price for lemonade is 50 cents. Obviously it's gonna be very hard for me to pay myself much if my lemonade costs 49 cents. But I do think that there's a market out there for, for 50 cent premium lemonade. When I try to sell it, People do pay extra for my like hand-squeezed artisanal leather apron lemonade. How am I gonna make my money? Because people want artisanal lemonade for 50 cents. How am I gonna make my money at it? Usually we say, 
I think that's your problem, right? <laughs> like, and, and so um, it may be that there's other things we do. I mean, there is like literally no protectionist measure you can imagine that wouldn't make someone happy. You know, the video games industry is actually a really interesting example of what happens when Congress hates you and you have problems. So the video games industry, like every time they came to Congress until like maybe 10 years ago when they, people started to wake up and realize they were actually an industry that made money for the balance of trade. Until then, every time they showed up at Congress and said like piracy is killing us, they were like, that's awesome. The sooner you die, the better, right? <laughs> and so they stopped selling physical discs, right? And then they um, created things like networked games. And you know, World of Warcraft made more money than all the video games that came before it because they had a thing that wasn't piratable. They had a thing that you, uh, you, know, you, you needed access to their server and to access their server you needed a password and to get a password you had to get their credit card number. And so they, they came up with a different kind of game. Uh, and you know, I, I, I liked the other games and I missed those other games. But like, I also like all kinds of things that don't exist anymore, like daguerreotypes and uh, you know, penny farthings. But I don't expect all of our priorities in the 21st century to be suborned in the service of my personal aesthetic priorities. Like, I do believe in funding the arts. Like, I'm a Canadian, so I'm practically a Marxist. So like, I'm. <laughs> I'm all for like giving money to people who want to do things that are not economically viable. Our usual name for that is art, right? That's cool. Uh, I just don't think that like if you can't make a business out of it, if you are you know going galt with your awesome idea to make smart light bulbs, and you can't figure out how to make them economically, like that's not Congress's problem. And if the cost that you impose on all of us is that none of us can trust any of our devices as a consequence of your burning need to make smart light bulbs. You know, tough noogies is I think the, the legal term, right? <laughs> so I hear you, there's, good, there's cool gadgets out there waiting to be made, but this might not be their economical moment or it may be that uh, the people who make them have to do a top to toe rethink of how they're making them. But I don't think it's my job to solve their problem. For one thing, I have a feeling if I showed up at the doors of these companies and said, don't use DRM, organize your business on these lines. They'd say, who the heck do you think you are telling us how to run our business? How many smart light bulbs have you made, kid? And the answer would unfortunately be zero. And so uh, I don't think I'm in a position to dictate that to them. Um, we've had uh, two men in a row. Are there any women? Yes, up here. Just keeping an eye on the clock here. Uh, I think this is our last question. Is that right, Joe? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. So, are there any laws, anything in protecting security researchers right now? Uh, there are some tiny little things at the margin. So, the DMCA has an exemption for security researchers that in 22 years no one has ever been able to use because it's so narrow. And the consensus is that it's basically useless. Uh, every three years, Congress, ha or the Copyright Office rather, holds hearings on the MCA 1201 to see whether it's doing its job. And in theory, they are empowered to grant exemptions to the DMCA, but those exemptions are use exemptions, not tools exemptions. So they are allowed, for example, in the last one they said, you're allowed to jailbreak your iPhone, but you're not allowed to make a tool to jailbreak your iPhone or sell that tool or tell someone how to make the tool, or report on any of the mistakes that Apple made when they designed the iPhone that would allow you to make such a tool. So it's a really symbolic m measure. Now the Copyright Office did in fact grant uh, an exemption for security research, but again that exemption doesn't include tools. So security researchers can say, I broke the DRM on this voting machine and found that it was insecure, but they can't tell you how they did it, which may be the key to understanding that it is insecure, right? In general, we expect science to progress when people can describe their methods. You know, before we had science, we had alchemy, which is a lot like science without the methodolog methodological disclosure, right? Alchemists were all in a race to see who could like turn lead into gold and live forever. And so alchemists never told each other what they discovered. So every alchemist discovered for themselves in the hardest way possible that they shouldn't drink mercury, right? And it was only when we had publication that the base metal of superstitious alchemy was converted to the precious material of science. And it was done because the people 
described how they knew what they thought they knew, and other people told them about the dumb mistakes they'd made. And if security researchers can, can only, can break DRM, but only tell you what they found after they were done, and not how they found it, then it's not science anymore. We're back to the dark ages. We're back to alchemy. And so uh, without statutory reform, I think we have real problems. Now, as I said, we're representing a security researcher in a lawsuit against the US government, arguing that the First Amendment protects his right to publish his security research. And we have a good sense that that lawsuit will carry. It's based on two recent Supreme Court decisions, Eldred and Golan, which were not wins for people who care about information and freedom, but which did have important provisions that said, for example, the First Amendment protects uh, uh, is, is only, that copyright law is only cognizant with the First Amendment if uh, you can uh, um, have fair use and if it doesn't stretch to cover things that aren't traditional copyrighted works like light bulbs. So those feel like slam dunks to us. And we're going to go back to the Supreme Court over the next 10 years and when we get there we're going to say this is what you told us, did you mean it? And I think we're going to win. And when we do, well, then the law just pops like a soap bubble, which is great. And long before we get there, there's going to be lots of opportunities for people to take advantage of the impending change, which will be palpable. You know, the VCR was invented in 1976, and no one knew if it would be good or bad for the entertainment industry. By 1984, because people went ahead and made them, even though Sony was being sued by Universal for that whole time, there were six million VCRs in America. And when the Supreme Court met in 1984 to rule in Betamax and decide whether VCRs would be legal, they drove past video rental stores. And it was just like obvious that it would be really dumb to ban VCRs at that point. It's kind of the bet we're making, that you all will go and create uh, better services, services that break DRM in order to restore property rights to the people who own these devices, and that that will perform the function of proving our, our, the wider case that society won't collapse if people can treat their property as property. Well, I really have to thank you all for having me here today. Uh, I think I'll be signing books in 15 minutes in the lobby if any of you would like to have your books defaced. But in any event, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.